Okay, we're going to start right at the very beginning, Daniel. When we were preparing for this interview, you shared with me a beautiful piece of information. You've been with your husband, Bruno, for 33 years. So, and I, that's absolutely amazing. So what's your secret to having a long-term successful relationship? Well, it's now 34 years, oh, so it's, it's counting again. So, well, one of the secrets is to keep one an to give one another some space to have other adventures and not stay between the four walls all together all the time. So yes, it's liberty. I have mine. We have well, we have grown. We were very young when we met one another. He was twenty eight. I was twenty four. Oh, wow. And so we, we are now approaching the sixties. <laughs> And it means that our interests have evolved, but um, in opposite directions. But still, we have to give one another the liberty to, to live our own lives as well and keep the essential, in fact. At the end of the day, what's important is that we are together. And of course, at the beginning, it was a very sexual relationship. It turned out to be now more like a brother relationship you know so well we can't always live together but we can't always live apart too long without one another so yes giving some space is one thing being tolerant understanding the other in uh, points of interest of the other person i think it's one of the secrets beautiful you said you came from a lucky family. How so? I don't come from a lucky family. I'm very lucky to have the family I have. Hmm? Because I'm 59, and it's, you can imagine that 45 years ago, I was, uh, well, 48 years ago, I was 11. I was going to church school, and one of the friends with whom I was uh, going to church school, uh, had a gay father. Uh. And I thought, well, and like all the children of our age, we were making jokes about the father of this, of this girl. And then suddenly my father came to me and he told me, well, you stop making love at this, at, uh, at this person, his name was Raymond. So you stop making fun about Raymond because he's my friend, he lives with another man, so he doesn't do any harm to anybody, he just loves like anybody else. So you wow. start making jokes about the, my friend Raymond. So that's how it happened. So at the, at the age of 11, 45 years ago, my father taught me to be tolerant and to be accepted, to, to, to show acceptance. So I had no problem. I never came out gay to my parents. They, they knew before me. So um, That's very progressive. For your father yes, in that generation, at, at that time, it was still considered some a taboo. Even even here in Belgium, Belgium yeah. is a very Catholic country. Uh, well, Fifty years ago, it was a very Catholic country, and people did not imagine that two men or two women could live together right. and love each other. So, well, uh, now with the history, I see that uh, my family was. Not just tolerant, very open-minded. That's how lucky I feel. That's my lucky family. You told me that your first positive image of gay life was the village people. Please tell us a bit about that. It, it took me a long time to come out to myself because the image that I had about the <coughs> Well, I come from a village in Belgium, and the image I had of being gay was being feminine, cross-dressing, yeah. and I did not identify myself to to this person. Well, I don't have any uh, reaction. Is their their choice to dress like women or vice versa? But it wasn't. I wasn't feeling. I couldn't identify myself with this kind of image. So when the village people started, I said, wow, can you be gay and wear this kind of clothes? And I was 
completely madly in love with the, the leather man. Glenn Hughes. Glenn Hughes. Yeah. <laughs> and this started my, to, to give, to see my own homosexuality as something positive. You see, so it say so okay. If it's, if it also means to be gay, well, then I don't have a problem being gay as well. Fantastic. How did you first realize that you liked leather fetish? Tell us about your BDSM journey. <clears throat> well, the love for leather came when I saw the, the village people first at one point and then BDSM it was always in me and I was well even very attracted by certain scenes that we, you see around Easter with the Christ being whipped uh, and uh. Oh, this was the best moment of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like Christmas, I prefer Easter. <laughs> <laughs> but then Okay, well, all these scenes where you see a, a, some sort of violence, it's, uh, I find it attractive. Hmm? Now, okay, you can make the difference between pure violence, hmm? yeah. slavery or torturing, and BDSM as we know it, something consensual. Hmm? So this is the difference, but the first, Kick that I had from from these images come from well, the, the, well images of the Christianity, which is extremely violent. Yes, yes. What emotion does that give you when you see those kinds of images? Give me. Well, I want to. I would like well, when I see this. I would like to be part of the scene. See? Being on one side or the other, I can give or receive, I don't care. So, but I would like to be part of the scene. So, yeah, I, okay. I, 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 I would like to commit to this kind of uh, acts. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Well, please tell us about the Amsterdam gay leather scene as you knew it. You frequented Amsterdam instead of Brussels. What was going on? Why was that? Because when I, when, when, when I came out as a, as a leather man, I was 23, 24, which is a lot, which is 35 years ago. And Excuse me. The only, Belgium was a very conservative country, so the only gay magazines that we could get were coming from the Netherlands of France, but France was less liberal than the, than, than the Netherlands. So mm, yeah. the, the magazine that I received from, from the Netherlands just showed addresses of gay bars, showed addresses of associations where you could refer to, ask questions. They had gay switchboards and they could direct you to different places uh, and parties. Uh which did not exist in Belgium. And so uh, this is the first, um, this is how I, I decided, well, I'm gay, I have to assume it. But the only, the only points of contact that I had were in, in Amsterdam. Okay. And too, well, I didn't enjoy too much, the, uh, for too long, the, the leather scene in Amsterdam, because the, at the second time I went there, I met my husband. Oh. <laughs> it, do you, Remember which place? Oh, it's a place on the Amstel. It does not exist anymore, and it's called a com it was called a company bar. Ah, uh, okay. It was no, it, one of these places on the Amstel. There were three or four uh, gay bars. They all had back rooms at that time. And uh, well, it was the afternoon bar. Ah, uh, you must have visited Amsterdam at a time when the leather scene was really in full swing. Yes. Well, you, tell us about some of the uh, bars, some of the places that you knew at that time. So, Amsterdam was known for the fetish scene, more, more for the leather scene, fetish scene. The rubber was not too, 
too important at that time, but there were about five or six leather bars. Um, half of them being closed now. Eh? Yeah, um, yeah. Which is a pity, but it seems to be an evolution. And, but now you can, f well, Amsterdam was the only place where you had a choice of bars. You could be there and be in a cafe downtown or April a long time ago where you could be there in leather in the afternoon, you could be in, in the early evening in certain in certain uh, leather bars and you can spend the nights in other bars. Yeah, okay. So you, well you could you could you could have a twenty four hours yes. going out yes. in leather bars there. And the Amsterdam was the only place where you could do that at that time. Where were your favorite bars? What was my favorite bar? I like the Argos. The Argos was one of them. Yeah, Argos um, was amazing. And there was a small one called the Spiker. Hmm. So the Kerkstraat. And well, this, these were my two favorite bars. Um, well, the Argos is the, was the first leather bar to be opened in Europe. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. It was the first one in, in the late 60s. Oh. So this was the first, well, well, when you come to Europe, you speak about the Argus. Everybody knows who, which, which bar it is. Yeah. At least the oldest generation. <laughs> <laughs> I was only able to visit the Argos a few times, mm -hmm. and it was toward the end of its, of its time. But yes, it was an amazing bar, yeah. truly. Uh, and now, uh, uh, talking about the Argus, I would like to say something that may not be consensual, that maybe that some maybe some people will not appreciate. But it's a double responsibility: the responsibility of the bar owner to keep it to keep the place as a leather bar. Mm. It's also the responsibility of the leather man to go to the bar in leather, to keep the leather going. Yes. It's not normal when you when you are a leather man, you go to a bar to a bar like the Argus, they're not dressed in leather, but you complain that there is nobody in leather. Mm. That's the first responsibility. You go to the Argus because it's a leather bar, you expect to have back rooms where you can have fun. It's not normal that the owners of the bar at that time put their boxes in front of the back rooms to prevent people to go uh, into the back rooms. Uh, so there is a double responsibility somewhere. You can't blame it on one side. You, can, you, you should. Everybody should take its part of the responsibility for the closing of so many uh, leather bars in Europe. Yeah. I think you're correct on that. The Antwerp um, leather scene was better than Brussels. Tell us why Antwerp is a little bit better in that respect. Well, in Antwerp, you have the. Um, in fact, we have Brussels and Antwerp have, over the years, split the interest of the people of the gay people. And Antwerp has become the fetish reference in, in Belgium, okay. if, not in, if not in Europe. But, and then Brussels is more for the bear scene. Oh, I see. And also for the young crowd who likes to party, dancing, uh, with parties like La Demos in Brussels. So every month there is La Demos, and you have the bear scene as well, which is very developed in Brussels more than in Antwerp, so okay. there is a kind of consensus and, you know, if you go out for the bears, you go in Brussels, if you go out for the leather, okay. you prefer to go to Antwerp. This is my first visit in Antwerp, and I have to say Belgian leather fetish pride is an amazing event. This is incredible, in this gigantic facility with so many people. Why? has this event become so successful? I think you have to put it on the excellent organization. Mm -hmm. um, well, 
I think it's in the DNA of, the, of Yerun to, to be an organizer. And so I, I would say, well, it's always thinking a mile forward. It always makes the extra, uh. extra mile. And you know, at different places, different events that I've been to, I've been to many of them. One, an event is successful, you repeat the same pattern again and again. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. also, there is nothing new being input the year after and so uh, on. So every year uh, here is the same pattern, but 80% remains the same, 20% changes. So there is always something new to discover here. Hmm? You can imagine how big it is. But also, is, well, they have doubled the space last year. No? Oh my gosh! Before, okay. Before, before that, it was just half the space. Oh. Now you have more vendors. You have larger back rooms. You, you have plenty of new things, and different contests uh, happening here, like the Mister the Yoga of Mister. Yes. Uh, uh, the Mister Peppy. Fetish, um, how do you call them? The superheroes. Yes, yes. And of course, the Mr. Leather Belgium. Fascinating. I, I have to say, uh, this is such an admirable situation. I wish we could see events like this in more places. I have to say, Belgium does it right. They really do. Thank you for Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. We were in Manchester in October yes. for Manchester Leather Pride. And I had the privilege of seeing you whip a cigarette that someone was holding. Literally, you cut the cigarette in half. Yes. How did you acquire that skill? First, I wanted to cut the cigarette in three, but I put it in, in uh, uh, half. Uh, 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 so, uh, I learned by myself, um, it's a self-tuition, self I bought a video of uh, how to master a whip coming from Australia, and, and then I saw the how to do it, and the first thing I learned about myself, and it helped me a lot, also in my private life, is to focus on something, and focusing on something makes you reach your goal. Yes. And then it's the same with whips, you know? You know what you want to touch, and then when you have, well, when you know the whip, you know how it moves, you know how it, where it will reach, so you can target at something very precisely. Yes. So, but it takes time. I started to use a whip by hanging a backpack on a tree and trying to reach the backpack with my whip. <laughs> How many whips do you have? I don't count them. <laughs> <laughs> What's been your most awkward BDSM moment? Say that again, please. What has been your most awkward BDSM moment? The best one, I would say, at Folsom, when I've been able, for the first time, well, I'm usually at top, giving the whip, but I've been able, well, I saw somebody who was mastering his whips, and I've been able to say, okay, it's my time now. So, I take off my shirt, and the guy used his bull whips on me, okay. and I did it in public, because before that, it was something that I could do in private, but for the first time I could do it in, in, in public. And, well, it takes time to, 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 to be able to manage the pain that you receive with a whip, so it was a challenge for me. <laughs> Is there a BDSM activity that you still want to try? But you haven't yet? Mm, 
now because I think, well, there is nothing that I want to do that is not consensual. Okay. Um, no, I think I have, I have my my fantasy is being very square. I know what I can do, I know what I want, I know what attracts me, and I don't want to do anything that wouldn't that would go further to what I I like in a sense. Mm -hmm. What I like is not just giving pain, but giving pain by also kind of mesmerizing yeah. my partner, huh? just by being confident, it's, it's BDSM, it's not pure sadomasochism. Right, right, yeah. A moment ago you, you spoke of some of these newer fetishes that have come into the community, one of them being the superheroes and puppies. What are your thoughts on, the, on those sorts of things coming into the community? I think there is space. There is space for every fetishes. <coughs> every minority in minority has the right to create the their own space where they feel comfortable. So these are new fetishes. Well, some of them I don't find attractive because it's not me. They have the right to exist. But as different fetishes with different organizations, there is a respect that should be shown to one another. Yes. And I don't want to be consensual again. I've seen them many times. Puppies coming to leather scenes and trying to disturb the leather scenes. Mm -hmm. We as leather men would never go to a drag party to a rubber party in full leather, to a puppy event in full leather, to mess it up. Right, hmm? right. And so, okay, it's a young generation, but they should learn the first thing, respect one another. Yes, yes. And this is something that still needs to be acquired by certain sub-communities. How do you see them learning that? We try to do it, well, we have conversation with the puppies as such. They come to our events, they are welcome. But if someone abuses the situation, yeah. we are, it's our role as well to tell them, you are going too far. Yes. What, would, how would you react if we go to your party and try and make fun of your party? Yeah. That's that's a give and take uh, attitude, I guess. Tell us about the ECMC. What exactly is that for an audience member who may not be familiar? Uh, the ECMC was created 45 years ago, mm -hmm. at a time where in some countries like Norway, homosexuality was still illegal. So imagine. Uh, the situation, the legal, you didn't speak about uh, two men living together, two men kissing in the street. Well, even 20 years ago, you could never imagine that persons of the same sex could get married True. and enjoy equal rights. True. Okay, in Belgium, you celebrated last month 15 years of equal rights. You are very, you know, you live in a very lucky country. Yes. But the ECMC was created at a time where people needed to have contacts across Europe when they were on tour, trying to find uh, accommodation where they were going on their motorbikes. So at the very beginning, the ECMC was a confederation of motorcycle clubs. It evolved with the evolution of our community. It evolved to become a leather community with motorbikes as well, and then it evolved to be a more accept well, with more acceptance for the uniforms, for the rubber, for the skinheads, 
on the original motorbike aspect seems to have disappeared quite from many clubs now. Uh, uh, but still, the ECFC exists because there is a need next to these events which are commercial, sexual, there is still a need to have social events. True. People need to get together, learn from each other, do something together. Hmm? It was a leather man, well, a, a, a handful of leather men who started the Chechnya 100 project to raise money for the Rainbow Railroad to save people in Chechnya, not Kosovo, in Chechnya. <laughs> And, and to, to, to bring people in a safe heaven. We, we as a leather community, we should realize that by staying together, putting our energy together, we can save lives. True. We should be proud of this. Huh? Absolutely. And this project was started with uh, uh, Joe King and Raymond and the European title holders. And being taken over, and it continues. Where do you see e e I'm sorry, ECMC going in the future? I'm still, well, we had some difficulties over the years. We have been hit by the AIDS epidemic at one time. We could get together and, and find uh, ways to bring our knowledge together to fight AIDS in our local communities. We have been uh, influenced by the commercial websites, which also bring us very positive elements like Recon and Planet Romeo, all these kind of uh, websites. But now the evolution also the older clubs are here to help the new communities to, to be created. Well, we are supporting, well, ECMC is supporting uh, community, remote communities uh, from Wales. We are supporting uh, an incredible community in Nice, in the south of France. Um, we have also uh, a community being developed in St. Petersburg in Russia. Oh, they, wow. need, they need our help. Yeah. And that's why we should be here to help them create their own communities there. And create the network of knowledge, the network of uh, contacts all around Europe. Speaking of the differences of various locations, North America, Europe, you mentioned Russia, what are the major changes that you see, or rather, let me let me rephrase that. <clears throat> what are the major differences you see in those communities? Europe is a small continent which is very highly populated, and so you can be two hours in Berlin, you can be in two hours in in, in Scandinavia, you can be in two hours in in Italy. One hour to Paris, one hour to London, an hour and a half to Amsterdam. So, well, what we say in Europe is a very big continent with small distances. Yeah. <laughs> and the population is, uh, well, I would say 150% what it is in North, in North America. So, distance is not a, a problem. So, you can be at any party whenever you want. While in the United States, you have to cross, well, we have to travel across timelines if you want to go to Chicago, to yeah. New Orleans, or to San Francisco. So distance is one of the differences. I think that it's my belief. Huh? I don't, I may be saying something wrong, but I see that in the United States, the communities are gathering, are organized around uh, people who attend a certain place, a bar, or an event. And these yes. communities are created on one specific place. Yes. While in Europe, our communities are 
created by a group of people, and we visit different places. Uh. And also, the difference is that in Europe, we are not familiar to fundraising. Uh, or in the United States, may, many of the clubs, many of the organizations are organized around fundraising for a good cause. Yes. For a person, for a community, for a specific aspect, in, uh, specific happening in, in your community. Yes. So it gives uh, a focus for a group of people to get together and to do something together which is something that still does not exist too much in Europe. Why do you think that we have that in the United States, but you don't have it here? We are the welfare state here in most countries of Europe, you know? So we don't have to, well, not to care, but we don't have to have second thoughts about having access to medication when we are uh, here. Yeah. We don't have to have too big concerns when we have to go to a hospital. Yes. Because you know that all the taxes that you pay will not be spent to play golf, but it will be spent to care about your health. Yes. It is a huge difference between European nations and, and United States. Mm -hmm. When we were preparing for this interview, you depicted a difference between commercial and non-commercial leather fetish events. Yes. Talk with us about that. What does that mean? I think a good example here, the le leather pride in Antwerp. You see it's financed by all the vendors that come here. Hmm? But it gives a space for the non-commercial communities. So there is, well, all the contests, all, well, the MSC Belgian stand there, everything, we have this access for free. So it, it means that it's a good thinking of what commercial can do to make the social community, the social aspects of the community develop themselves too. So it's a good synergy between the two. <coughs> okay. Does that answer your question? I, I think, uh, I'm not completely clear, do you see a benefit to one side or the other? Yes, because it gives to the people the two aspects, well, the commercial aspect, they can buy all the leather and the rubber that they want to, they can have the big parties, they can go to social events, the leather social, the bluff social events, the bluff dinner, uh, whatever, so they can socialize as well. Yes, yes. And Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, and, and also, well, they, they can have the fun aspect, they can uh, get together with people who think likewise. Well, I think it's everything you need in one space. Everything you are looking for in one space. And I would say it's very successful. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about titles? in the leather community. Titles are an important part of our community. First, because, well, I speak for Europe, no? because in Europe, That's fine. most of the contests are organized by non-commercial organizations, members of the CMC or not, but they are non-profit organizations. It gives the opportunity for the local communities, gives the opportunity to one person to represent the community, to be visible for themselves, and make the small communities visible uh, locally, but also nationally and internationally. 
Yes. So for me, it's a, a, a title which is well understood means that it can only provide positive return for your community. It's, unfortunately, we have seen in, in the past some titles being created for the sake of one person who wants to be visible. True. And then they create a title and they give time to themselves in, and this is deviation, which hopefully doesn't last long. But the first positive aspect of this is showing to the world that your community exists. What do you think makes a successful title holder? A person does not expect the community to serve him, mm. but somebody who thinks that by being a title holder he has a responsibility to bring something back to the community that he that elect, elected him. That's whatever it is. Huh? It can be becoming a committee member, it can be uh, traveling around the world, it can be raising money for rebel railroads. Yeah. And trying, like joking is doing now, is trying to renovate and, and modernize the CMC to prepare it for the next generation. So everybody has a stone to bring to the wall, I guess. And this, this is a good understanding of a title order. He should do something that will remain after him. You saw the devastation caused by AIDS in the community. Talk with us a little bit about that. How did that affect the people here in Europe? So the, the AIDS epidemic uh, arrived a couple of years after the United States. I would say that in Belgium, the community that was most affected by the disease was the African community coming from our ex-colonies. And it took time for the gay community here in Belgium to be aware that they were a problem. They don't want, they don't, they first didn't want it to be stigmatized. It's a gay disease, so it delayed the consciousness that they took, the, their awareness that they took about being your sexual practices are the pro uh, uh, sexual practices are the problem as long as you don't control them, as you don't make them safer. So this is a reason why Belgium, I can speak about Belgium, was really affected by AIDS. And the community took took conscience about what's happening, uh, but it took years too long to be aware of this. Oh. Now the, the the campaigns for the AIDS prevention are doing a good job, not just on the aspect of AIDS, but all the side uh, aspects of uh, sexual health, not just AIDS, but also using of chemicals, yes. Uh, uh, yes. prevention for other transmitted diseases. So everything is being taken care of by the same groups because they are all related to one another. How was Belgium affected as opposed to the Netherlands, as opposed to Germany? other nations? Compared to the Netherlands, we are always one step backwards. We are, we are just making some kind of uh, benchmarking, benchmarking with uh, the Netherlands, but well, they, they are the best at taking initiatives for the prevention, for the health care, and Belgium is always one or two years backwards. Still, we are very well positioned compared to other countries in Europe. Oh. So, 
what can I say more? Uh, so can, can you repeat the second the, the, the question? I, I, I was wondering how Belgium was affected as opposed to mm -hmm. the Netherlands or Germany or other nations. Mm -hmm. Well, this I well I can compare because I don't have the knowledge of the of the problem. I just can say I've been the president of the club. Uh, at the early 90s, during 19s, uh, for about 20 years, and I would say that 80% of the members died of AIDS. Wow. So, well, nowadays, there are very few people of that time, of that period of time, that, that are still alive. Yeah, yeah. Because, well, it took back to the mid 90s, well, the beginning of the of the years 2000 to find a uh, medication that was uh, yeah. uh, appropriate. You became positive later in life, in your 50s. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? First, I, f I felt like a stupid asshole because I've spent 20 years of my life to mm, to deliver a message of prevention, I spent 20 years using condoms, and something wrong happened. It was, well, it happened five years ago, and at that time you didn't speak about PrEP. But PrEP would have helped me to, to stay negative, I would say. Mm. And that's how I understand PrEP now. Uh, something that is... is the second condom, I call it. Yeah. Uh, well, it's just my my own opinions. It's the second condom. You can't get rid of the first one, but you can use the second one. So the first one always stays clean. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. What future do you see for the leather community here in Belgium? There is a future because we have a young generation arriving in the club. The people who are over 50 are the minority in our club. Wow, that's great, sort of. With, which I can compare with other clubs in Europe, the majority, where the majority of the members of other clubs in Europe are over 50 which is not the case here in Belgium. So there is still an attraction for leather and for other fetishes as well. We are specifically leather, rubber, and uniform club, but it still attracts a young generation. The president of our club is, uh, is uh, 42 or 43. Oh, I see. So he's quite young, and he attracts people who are younger than himself. We have uh, members who are in, the, in their 20s, which is quite, I would say, well, I don't want to to to, to put a, a hand on that, but uh, I would say, well, we are one of the very few clubs in Europe to be that lucky. I would agree, because we hear that all the time. No young people are coming into the community, so I'm very happy to hear that you're seeing that here yes. in Belgium. Yes, and, and I don't have a recipe to say, well, we have did that to attract the young people, so this is uh, a tip, a, a hint to do it for your own community. No, because it just happened. Yeah. We're just happy that it happened, but we don't know why. But at the end of the day, it's because the commercial scene is very developed in Belgium, and at one point, people want to have something more than just parties, and buying stuffs, yeah. they want to socialize with people who have the same attraction for leather, and don't and they don't have to explain their attraction. Right. They are with people who have the same feelings, and that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. If you could change any of your history, would you change anything? And why?
I thought about this question so many times. What I would do be less stupid. Even be more open minded to other people views and attraction. It took me time and I don't want to hide it to accept the fact that women are also part of our community. True. It's by going to the United States for IML in 2005 that I realized that women played an important role in our community. Maybe not in Europe, but in the United States. Women were there to take care of their brothers when they became sick. That's mm -hmm. right. So that's one point that shocked me about myself. Mm -hmm that I was, yes, I was some kind of misogynic. Uh, do you say that in English? Mis misogynistic. Mis misogynistic mm -hmm. at one point, but by having contacts with other communities, yeah. I changed my mind. For me now, women are an important part of my life, an important part of our community, and I will defend it. That's beautiful to hear. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest misconception about you? One of the misconceptions, people think that I spend my time, I spend my money, I travel all around the world to be visible for myself. Uh, and, I, and that I want to be in the spotlight all the time. In fact, by doing, by traveling all around the world, making contacts with people, inviting people, being invited, I created a network, and I want everyone to benefit from the from the contacts that I have. Hmm? If I die now, all my contacts will be lost. So it will be useless. But people think that I am doing it to be visible. Okay, it's a reward of doing this work. Huh? Okay. But it's not the, the goal of all my traveling and my involvement in the community. Thank you, Daniel Dumont. Thank you very much. For an absolutely wonderful interview. Thank you.